I was kind of shocked at how willing people were to show up and want to like help and want to help people heal. Oftentimes it's getting better now, but if I tell a fellow therapist that I've written this book, they gave me that really like head tilt, like you think that beating the crap out of each other is a healing thing. Um, and then I have to explain, no, right, like, and I have to explain. And so, you know, you would kind of expect based on the reputation of jujitsu and the UFC and everything else that like people are nasty, right? That they don't want to share and that they're not going to talk to you and all the bravado and everything. But it was none of that. And it has never been any of that. What is going on? Welcome back to Jiu-Jitsu Outlet. I'm sitting down with an author, uh, a medical professional, basically, and a jujitsu Blue Belt, Miss Anna Perkle. How are I'm you doing? Awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, a couple of the listeners reached out to me and requested that I get you on and talk about your book, Transforming Trauma with Jiu Jitsu, that you co authored with Jamie Marich. And we're going to have Jamie on the show too. We weren't able to make it work out with everyone's schedules, but um, I'm really excited to talk about the book. But before we get into talking about that and how Jiu Jitsu can help with trauma, want to ask you the question that we start off every interview with, which is how does training in jujitsu help your mental health since you started? So let's see if I can get this under three hours, <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, look, the summary sentence I wanted to give you, uh, cause I knew you were going to ask me that was that it, it changes, it helps to change the limbic brain's perceived sense of threat. Okay. Um, and I'll give you an, a personal example from my own life and, and, and my experience on the mats. Um, so I was a white belt in the combatives program, that street fighting program. And, you know, like most dojos, if you're, you know, doing better as a newer student, they start pulling you up to demo. Um, and I noticed that there was one instructor in particular that I was super squirmy, not listening to what he was saying, like was an awful demo, <laughs> just doing a terrible job. And I wondered, you know, why for many weeks, like what is going on here? Why, why am I having a sensitivity to this instructor? Cause he's not doing anything, you know, improper with me. He's amazing. Um, and then it was one of those things in the middle of the night, you're like, oh, right. You, you recognize, oh my gosh, no way. So here I am digging in Facebook, looking for the guy's name. And I'm like, oh, wow, same eyebrows, about the same height, right? All this is happening. Meanwhile, it's been, I don't know, 35 years, <laughs> 40 years or so. And I'm like, okay, why do I feel anything about this? Like literally from the head, from my head to my toe, I'm feeling icky, sticky, angry, agitated. I need to like do something just looking at his photo. Um, so anyway, I realized that I'm being triggered because this instructor who happens to be Henry Gracie looks a lot like a special guy from my past. So anyway, I reach out to um, Eve and ask, what do you do when students are triggered? Because I was kind of curious as a therapist too, like how do they handle this? She was first class, um, you know, just thank me for sharing it. I will keep this in confidence and you need to let us know what you need because everybody's different. And I said, okay, great. I don't know what I need. She's like more Hunter, less Hunter. I'm like, let Hunter be Hunter. I don't know what I need. Anyway, I finally decided that as I was taking my pink belt test, actually it wasn't combative. That's right. It was, it was my women's empowered self-defense program. Anyway, I finally decided that if it was going to be a real test, like me really upset. And a lot of us had talked about how we'd like to kind of be surprise tested in the parking lot to see if the skills really would stick if the adrenaline was pumping. And I went, oh my gosh, like this is perfect because I pre-tested with another instructor and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm killing it. I'm getting a hundred. But if I do this with Henner, I don't know if I'll even pass. So what do you know? Um, they agree that they're going to let me test with him, even though he wasn't testing, you know, he doesn't do that. Um, you know, other people are typically doing that. So that was nice of them. And um, so we get into the room and, you know, as soon as he even walks in, I'm like, back up, ah, you know, <laughs> he's like, Anna, do you want to uh, get a sip of water? <laughs> you want to calm down? Um, and I am absolutely, no, let's get this over with. I hate this. There was literally a moment during the test where I semi blacked out. Like I missed a period of time. That's how much I was triggered. Um, I actually started hitting him. <laughs> 
that a part of the test too. And although I passed, um, and I did pass with a reasonable score and I did well, there was, there was one basic technique that it's just, it's so embarrassing to even say it right now, but yeah, I messed up trap and roll. Okay. So anyway, I managed to pass the test. I am not bright red. I'm purple. I am so upset by the end of the test, but I pass. And I walk out to my vehicle and I, I don't know, instinctively pull up the picture of this guy again. And he's, I'm staring at his face and I went, wow, you can't hurt me. And I forgive you. And I realized in that moment, all of the physical sensations I had the first time that I looked at his photo after many years, gone, like wiped, at, wiped clean. There's nothing. There's no physical reaction from me whatsoever looking at his photo. And, and look, as a, as a mental health professional, I have searched for years for the ability to help my clients forgive. And I've read all the books and I've seen the things. And it was in that moment that I realized that my limbic brain was not interested in forgiving anything until it was safe enough to do so. It needed answers. It needed to feel safe enough in this world that it could shut down its vigilance and actually really forgive, not just, you know, intellectually, yes, of course I need to let this go, but like my body was not on board. I needed answers. Anyway, in that moment I went, wow, okay, I need this for like all my clients, all my friends, all my everybody, anybody who's had trauma, like, oh my gosh, like they need to have a physical experience empowering them that they might be able to stay safe in some way. Um, meanwhile, uh, one of my other guys told me, um, one of my uh, guys at the Sober Living, because I worked a lot with uh, men sober living, and the owner of the Sober Living uh, was also a jiu-jitsu instructor at Crone Gracie Black Belt. And so they're all doing jiu-jitsu. And he's like, Anna, you got to see this video. And it's Jamie talking about her healing experience. <laughs> so I immediately reach out to her and I'm like, I'm like, if you're ever wanting to connect on this, please call me. I had a huge healing experience. This is this is something special. Um, and she called me back and we both went, wow. Um, the North Atlantic Books at one point chased after her to write this book. Um, she had already written bunches of books. I don't even know how many at that point. It could have been over 10. Um, and she invited me to also participate in writing it because she had decided she was done with her journey after the women's self-defense program and wanted somebody who was still connected and working on it. So so anyway, enormous healing opportunity through jujitsu for trauma survivors. That caveat there, though, I need to say this, um, is with a good fit in the right gym. This isn't for everybody, and it's not for everybody at every single moment and every in time. Um, look, I had done a tremendous amount of work on myself before I arrived to that space. So, you know, even with my clients who arrive with different types of traumas, I'm not going to send them to jujitsu day two. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be very careful about which gym I send them to and have them pick something that really makes them feel safe enough to actually do the work that needs to get done. So people need to, you know, carefully consider when they have real traumas, when and how and seek professional help to understand what's going to be best for them. I've got so many questions based off what you just said, but thank you for sharing everything. And uh, it's powerful stuff. This It's like a powerful healing modality in a lot of ways, but you're right. It's something that people might need to be worked up to a little bit. Um, how do you feel like jujitsu helps you off the mats in other parts of your life, like maybe your relationships or in your career, or different areas off the mats, basically. Um, again, you know, how many hours do we have? I will focus in on the trauma piece only. <laughs> um, and look, if, and let's go right here. And I'm in trigger warning for people that have, you know, been through sexual assault, but let's say I've been raped. Um, and once that happens for a lot of people, if they're walking down the street, and let's say, you know, I'm female and that was male, my rapist. Um, I'm walking down the street. I happen to have my niece with me. She's eating an ice cream cone and telling me about her day. And this guy starts walking towards us. Every guy potentially after that rape becomes a potential rapist. So as I'm walking towards that guy, like I'm now worried, like, do I cross the street? Do like, how do I handle this situation? He keeps walking towards us, right? My brain has become vigilant. 
in all kinds of situations that it wasn't before, right? And then even my niece who's standing next to me, like I all of a sudden, I don't hear her anymore. I don't hear how her day was. I don't give a crap about her ice cream cone or mine. I don't care because the threat is coming to me. So I am checked out. I'm not present. I'm not able to enjoy life because I need to focus on the, the threat that's everywhere. So in that moment, if I've had this healing experience and then I see this guy, I'm like, okay, guy, who cares? Like, I'm good. Um, when I first started taking uh, training in jujitsu, uh, it still was in the beginning a vigilant thing for me. So I might see that guy and, and immediately size him up. Okay, how tall is he? Uh, you know, what, what technique would I use to get him to the ground, right? Because if he's too big, then, you know, maybe I want double leg or do I want to circle to the back? Like, how am I going to deal with him specifically? But then as time went by and I had more repetitions and I'm giggling and laughing and having fun in the mats and things are starting to just really become muscle memory, um, it became more of a game instead of a vigilance. Now I saw this as, oh, cool. How am I going to handle him? <laughs> And so much so that I could still be like present with, you know, the niece and the ice cream cone. And, oh, yeah. Tell me all about your day, girl. Like, it's good. Like, what's going on? Like, I see the guy coming. He's no problem. Like, right. And so it can have open up all kinds of happiness and an ability to just just be that a lot of people who've been through trauma don't even recognize that they are missing. They don't know half of them that what they have been through was trauma and they don't know how it's affecting them. Look, even myself, I, I, will, I will never forget. I've kind of always been a tomboy in my whole life and I don't wear a lot of dresses. And for some reason I was going somewhere after jujitsu training and I decided, okay, I'm going to put on a dress. Um, and then I'm walking out and a couple of guys are standing in the lobby and they gave me the one silver, but not in a like icky way, just in a like, oh gosh, like Anna's in a dress. This is weird, right? And I recognized in that moment that the old Anna, if any guy was looking at me in a dress, I kind of wanted to get out of the space as fast as possible. I didn't want his attention. I didn't want to, I didn't want him to think I was trying to draw his attention by my clothing or anything else. And in that moment, instead of feeling that way, I kind of stood there like, look all you want. Like, you want to meet me in a parking lot? I'll handle you. Like, <laughs> like, and it became it fun. Like, again, sort of like a game. And I know a lot of my my fellow females, too, we we joke about that. And we even joke about sort of all the laughing we do on the mats and how potentially humiliating it might be to a, a, an attacker someday if we're making all the noises and jokes that we make while we're rolling. That said, I'm not, you know, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not like trying to pick fights or, you know, and, and, and there are moments where I am sort of on alert. I'm by myself. It's late. It's dark. You know, I'm somewhere in Los Angeles. Like, it's not like I think I'm Wonder Woman, but, but life has changed. I get to wear a dress now and I don't care whether somebody's looking at me in it or not. <laughs> right. Um, and then one more thing I want to say about that too. Um, you know, and I've heard this on repeat and I, it really I really get it now um, in my heart and soul that, you know, people will often tell you, stand up for yourself, you know, don't let anybody push you around or bully you or, you know, like you need to like assert yourself. And they explain um, at my school with their bully proof program that, you know, that's great. You could tell a kid or an adult for that matter to stand up for themselves. But if they feel like they don't have the tools to back it up or try to neutralize something that might come after they stand up with themselves, it's not going to work and it might even backfire no. and then double down in their head that oh, I'll never do that again. Right. Um, never mind the fact that if I'm not confident in what I'm saying, Oh, stop it. You know, <laughs> versus, Hey, you can stop right there. Right. I see you. I'm looking you straight in the eyes. Hi friend. Like, and I don't have to be nasty about it, but I can also say, Hey, how's it going? How can I help you? You're a little close there. I need you to back up now. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's it's epic. I don't right. It's hard to summarize in a short time period the ten thousand ways this could change your life. Again, no, I, I really have to right. accentuate right school, right space because I mean, I literally have a lot of people at my school have been traumatized at other schools. 
Right. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. It's very well said. And uh, I've talked about it a lot on this show. And it's funny because sometimes when I bring this up, people kind of smirk at you a little bit. But I really think that martial arts unlocks like a dormant superpower that is within every human being. And that superpower in question is the ability to take someone else's life with your bare hands. And we don't put enough respect on that a lot of times. Like, no, guys, what we're doing here is learning how to kill people in under 10 seconds. Like, if you do these moves correctly to someone and there's no tapping in a life or death situation, they're going to exit this reality quickly. And that's something that when you have that ability within you and you feel it, no one ever has to explain it to you. Like I teach, uh, I'm getting ready to teach our kids class here in about 30 minutes. And uh, when you teach these kids like how to break someone's arm or uh, choke someone and you explain to them, like I, I always try to explain to them what would happen if they don't let go when someone taps, because I'm, I'm petrified that one day they're going to accidentally take it a little too far. You know, and I always emphasize safety a lot. And I explain to them, like, guys, if they don't, if, if they tap and you don't let go and you keep going, their arm is going to break right here and it's not going to be good. Like, they're going to need to go to the hospital. And you can just see, like, they get it. They're like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. Like, they, they get it pretty, pretty quickly. I don't usually have to tell them a second time. And, uh, then when they learn it, they, they walk away from there feeling like, oh, wow. Like, I didn't know I could do that. You know, that's pretty cool because the great thing about martial arts is I'm not giving you anything. I'm showing you something that your body can already do. I'm not like, like with shooting, I have to give you a gun and shooting's cool too. Don't get me wrong, but you have, there's clearly an outside thing, you know, the gun, right? And with martial arts, it's like, no, you can already do this. It's just, no one's ever like shown you this pattern that you move your body in and suddenly you're a, you're kind of like Batman. It's weird. It is. Kind of like Batman. It takes a lot of practice to get like Batman, just to just to be clear. <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight. But eventually, if you train for a long time, you develop this ability. Well, and look, for me as a female, too, like, you know, I, I train in the self-defense, eye gouging, kick them in the right. And I remember always thinking, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not fully convinced that in the middle of a big scuffle of which, you know, I've, I've been in fights before and I've seen plenty of fights and, you know, the ability to find that eyeball and, and do I even want to do that? Ugh, I don't want to put my finger anywhere. Like, just stay away from me. Um, and when I, when I first discovered even trap and roll, I'm like, oh my gosh, even the smallest little person can do this. And I often tell people the story too, that like, um, with my daughter, I think she was nine or 10 when I taught her the creepy hug technique. I'm going to frame the throat and back your hips away. I have never had a hug with her since that was not invited by her. <laughs> um, and I'm just like, okay, if like a nine-year-old can do this on a full-grown adult, this is something. This is really something. And it kind of levels the playing field a little bit, right? I mean, and of course, Right. The more jujitsu the big guy knows, like the more jujitsu I have to know to stay safe in that. The other thing that I love about it, too, that I think is unique about this martial art versus some of the others. And, you know, maybe there's some in jujitsu as well, but I don't necessarily have to hurt you to neutralize you. Right. Like you're attacking me. And I love the idea that I can hold the submission and maybe if I need to apply some pain before I make the decision, if I'm going to actually break the limb um, or I can right work to take you to the ground or at least, you know, again, neutralize your attacks. And, you know, maybe there's some of that, too, of course, in judo and things like that, where you're using their attack and right. And but I just I love that I don't have to be the bad guy to defeat the bad guy. I don't have to lower myself, right? Like you try to injure me. And then the, here's the ultimate humiliation too. Like, right. I didn't have to like injure you to like shut this all down. I didn't have to break your nose. Yeah. yeah you don't have to shoot a person. Like that's the other thing. I hear this a lot. People are like, oh, I don't need martial arts. I carry a gun. It's like, well, yeah, but what if you don't want to shoot this person? You know, because maybe they didn't do something that bad. Maybe they're just drunk. Like, I'm not going to shoot you just for being drunk if you lay your hands on me. 
but I am just going to hand fight a little and clear space and get away. But you know what I mean? Like you there, this, it just like with law enforcement, they need escalation of force, but I feel like we could talk about this all day, Anna, but I want to hear a little bit about your book. So can you tell us the story of how did you write, start writing this book with Jamie and what were some of your biggest takeaways from working on it? Um, so look, I, um, I had written one other book prior to this. So, it, you know, some writing was, was, um, not new to me, but I don't consider myself an author still. It's just weird. <laughs> um, I don't see myself that way. I just saw it as an extraordinary privilege to be a part of the process. And I saw myself more as um, a person that needed to like collect information from the community and, and put it here. So there was a lot of interviews with a lot of amazing people um, and just a lot of kindness and generosity of people's time and wisdom and people I never thought I'd connect with, like one of the Valente brothers, like, you know, these amazing black belts of, you know, all different kinds. Um, and so I just, I was kind of shocked at how willing people were to show up and want to like help um, and want to help people heal. And again, it's surprising, right? I feel like there's a, yeah, oftentimes it's getting better now, but if I tell a fellow therapist that I've written this book, they give me that really like head tilt. Like you think that beating the crap out of each other is a healing thing. Um, and then I have to explain, no, right. Like, and I have to explain. Um, and so, you know, you would kind of expect based on the reputation of jujitsu and the UFC and everything else that like people are nasty, right? That they don't want to share and that they're not going to talk to you and all the bravado and everything. But it was none of that. And it has never been any of that. Like for me at the school or anywhere I've been, it's very rare. Um, that said, um, I did have plans to visit 20 other gyms to help me like add some of that into the book about sort of the differences between gyms and you know, what different people might want and need, because I didn't want to be just a talking piece for my school. Um, but then COVID happened, like literally a month after I started writing. <laughs> so I couldn't visit any of the other gyms. Um, but anyway, I just, I was blown away at the kindness and the community of fighters, right? It just, it feels like an oxymoron. Like you feel like you're going to have to fight. And and that's the other thing that I've taken from my experience as a whole from jujitsu. Like, I mean, from day one, I was sort of welcomed in and just part of the tribe. And I, it was amazing to me to see a hundred women on the mat all taking care of each other. You know, it just, I was like, wait a minute, you know, women are usually competing. Who's the prettiest or who has this or right. And men too. Right. And there wasn't, that was all gone. We were just helping each other. And I think there is something about jujitsu in that if you're going to train for a long time and you need good training partners, you do have to take care of each other. You have to be careful with how you roll them and let them know what's coming and communicate with each other about injuries and, and, and. So anyway, the book only sort of reinforced all of those things in my head that even in a, as I took on this scary task in my eyes for myself, um, the community held me and gave so much to me. I have so many shout outs I could make right now, but you know, we don't have time. Um, and luckily for me, I had, of course, my co-author who's written dozens of books. So I was like, okay, Jamie will like <laughs> guide me. The, the truth of the matter is though, um, although I'm happy and proud with the final output, it it is really hard to write one book for three different target audiences. We were writing this for survivors, right? And trying to give them information on what this could look like for them and what they need to be careful about seeking in a school. And then we we're trying to write it for clinicians that might want to recommend it and what that might look like in a treatment protocol and all the rest. And then we were trying to like you know, let instructors know like what a triggered person might look like and how you might adjust your teaching habits and your environment to welcome these people and help them heal. Not that you were trying to make you into a therapeutic environment, but there's ways that you can respond to a trauma survivor that are going to help in ways that are not. Um, so they cut me off long before I thought I was going to be cut off in what I could write. 
Um, and I, even with my interviews, I had another 30 people I wanted to interview. And I'm like, what do you mean I don't get to interview anybody else? They're like, no, we're literally going to cut this back already by a hundred pages. Like you must stop. So I'm with a lot of people who wanted even more from like the clinical perspective of what's going on with the brain and everything else as you're doing this. Um, and Jamie and I had more to say, um, but there was no more room in that book to be had. So there was frustrations too in writing it. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a work of love. You know, you don't make any money off books at all. I mean, I spent a year of my life on this thing um, and I have a couple grand to show for it. So um, we did this because we really want people to have the information in case it might be something helpful to them. It's not, and it's not about ego or anything else. Like I said, this isn't my book. Like, yeah, it, it it's everybody's book. It's my community's book. It just, it filtered through me, right? I had to do the work on my pages because Jamie and I basically just divided and conquered. She's like, you take that chapter, I'll take this chapter. And then we we went. So anyway, I just hope, you know, my payment um, is, is not even that my name is involved in this. It's just when people have an experience and they're like, oh my God, that, that page in your book really helped me, or that page helped me understand what was happening to me, or that page helped me get to the right school or whatever. I'm like, yes, thank you. Yes. We're doing our, we're doing our job. So I love it. And I think that your book will have a lot more success over time. Uh, because there's a lot of, I feel like I started hearing about it when it first kind of came out. Um, but I still, um, I've been hearing about it a lot more lately because I think a lot of people are sharing it. You know, people get through it and then they buy it as a gift for someone. And, uh, and the other thing too is like, I've literally been hearing about your book since it came out and I have yet to just have the time to read it. And that's nothing, nothing that you guys can do. I'm just, freaking busy. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of people like that where it's like, it's on their reading list, but that they're just busy, you know? And that's, I think that's how books work. A lot of times is like, they become a lot more prolific as they kind of have been around for a minute. So I think, I guess all this to say, I think your, your good karma will come back to you for sure, because the community definitely appreciates what you're doing. Like from what I can pick up, it seems people are really loving the book. So I think just give it, give it a little time and We'll see it everywhere. You know, I, I, mean. I don't like the spotlight, so I'm good as it is. That's me just expressing my gratitude that like it has helped people. Um, that means the world to me. There was a um, a chief in Ghana, Africa, that told my dad uh, before he died many years ago they needed to leave his mark. Um, and when I get a message from somebody that like something helped them in a book, I'm like, okay, I left my mark. I'm good. Yeah, right. It's powerful, and if you can help one person, then it's worth yeah, it. That's what I I'm always done. think. Good. If it's just one or two people like that's great you know everything else is extra and um this is powerful it's powerful um well i think we've got time for about one more question so one thing i really wanted to ask you about kind of based off what you said is uh what do you feel like a good academy should have like you talked a little bit about like you know it's really important that they have a good academy and that not all of them are kind of created equal and some might be more aware to to trauma response and stuff like that what do you feel like if someone's listening to this and maybe they have a background it with dealing with trauma, what do you, what should they be looking for if they want to start training jujitsu? Um, so, uh, several things. And, and there's a page in my book that has an entire checklist, um, that they can take with them. Um, if you know, they want to review that, um, review schools with that checklist, but I'd say my top couple for sure would be that the school separates street from sport. Um, I don't want, especially trauma survivors, thinking that a particular technique is going to keep them safe out there in the world that leaves them open all kinds of punches. So I, you know, I, and then I'm telling them they don't have to have two separate programs, but I would ask that at a minimum, they're identifying what's, what's what. And I know there's some moves, it's on a spectrum. It's not black and white, like this is street, this is sport. Um but there are techniques that are very street and that's the ones that I would want to make sure that we are identifying so that people don't get out there and again, have another traumatic experience because they think, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to think of one spider guard or <laughs> right. Something is going to um, keep them safe. And then all of a sudden they've, they've been knocked out. 
So that'd be the first one. Um, the second one too is if this school lets them spar on day one and they have no jujitsu experience, like I don't want them going there. I'm sorry. Um, and that may seem harsh um, in some people's perspectives, but look, that'd be like me inviting you to come play chess, but I'm not going to show you how any of the, the characters move. I'm like, what do you mean we're going to spar? Like, I mean, technique sparring, fine. Like we learned a technique and now we're playing back and forth with each other to see if we can like defeat it and do it is different than, okay, just, just go for it. Right. So I feel pretty strongly um, about those two. Um, there's a whole other list of, you know, are there video cameras? Are there instructors background checked? And, 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 right? Um, but those two in particular, and especially for my trauma survivors and women, I feel pretty strongly about. Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like uh, to that first one, because I'm an instructor and what we try to do is uh, try to teach something, a style that works everywhere, like a style. Because I believe that if you just work to get on top and you just smash the person, like putting down a lot of pressure and you win the top battle, like if you win the takedown battle, get on top and just start putting down a lot of pressure that works in the street. It works in a tournament. It works if you go and do judo or wrestling or MMA. So that's what we teach is we just teach like, just don't, don't be a guard player. Like that's kind of what it goes down to. <laughs> like it, what I tell my students is like, if you are in guard, it's because something probably went wrong. You lost the takedown battle and now you, you can't get back up. Cause that's what I always tell them is like, try to get back up because that that's what my coaches instilled in me is uh don't play guard try to get back to your feet if you can't get back to your feet because they're putting down a lot of pressure now we can play guard because you can't get back up and now you need to punch right. block and isolate right. their arms and not right. get hit and then right. we can sweep them or and if we can't sweep them and get on top then we can try to submit them but that's like the final option you know, and that's what I teach them. I don't teach them like, hey, we're going to pull guard and go for a heel hook. That's like, you know, that's like things went wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I feel like that's my view on it is like the real the real martial arts is get on top. Stay on top. Put pressure, put pressure down. Beat them up. You know, like one of my one of my coaches, Mike Morgan, um, he looked at me one day, he was like, Paul, is it easier to submit someone if you're on top of them or if you're on bottom? I was like, gee, Mike, anytime I'm in mount, it's a lot easier than when I'm in guard trying to submit someone. I don't know. He was like, yeah, dude, get to mount. Don't worry about trying to like beat them up from the guard. So anyway, that's what I'll say to that. And to your case of, um, sparring on day one, we let the students, um, like you said, like kind of play with the techniques, but we let them do it at a high pace. And there's a lot of guys where they come in and maybe they wrestled or maybe they uh, or maybe they just grew up being a dude scrapping, you know, and they're 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 OK. But if it's someone who I can tell that they're a little shy and um, maybe they clearly are not comfortable, I just tell them, hey, just just watch, you know, just watch. If you want to try it, you could want to try the moves we did today you know, we'll match you up with someone who's a little more experienced and you can do kind of like a flow role. You know what I mean? And we'll help you out, but we're not just going to smash you. Um, now, that being said, if former wrestler comes in and he's right. ready to go and this is what he's been wanting, you know, because he missed wrestling. It's like, all right, let's let's freaking go. You know, that's fine. That's a different story, in my opinion. But if it's someone who's never grappled before. Right. So you got to be careful. Well, and, you know, I'm talking about trauma survivors. Right. True. So, yeah. So that's a different kind of Even the guy who right. was a prior wrestler, but now he's served, you know, a time in the military and he has some stuff stacked up. He might actually black out and hurt somebody like, you know, might be worried. And, and then he's going to feel horrible that he hurt the person. Yeah, I've met that guy. I've met I that bet guy. You have, right. So that's why I'm talking like even with those guys who aren't necessarily going to get hurt themselves. Like I'm going, let's just slow your roll a bit. Right. Let's and if trauma's involved, it's I'm speaking from the trauma lens, not for everybody. Right. I'm talking about people who've been through some crap. But again, the challenge with that is most people don't know. Um, they really don't. <laughs> you know? No, they don't. No, they don't. I did a yoga certification one time and they gave me some really good tips for dealing with trauma victims. 
they said the biggest thing is just don't ever force someone to do anything because you don't know what someone's been through in their life. So if just assume people have trauma and just don't force them to do anything. And that's always something that I do. Like even in the stretches, I ne- that's what they that's what they're telling us with yoga. Like in yoga, they don't ever tell you touch your toes. You know, a good yoga teacher should never say, okay, touch your toes. So a lot of people can't touch their toes. Instead, you say, reach towards your toes or, you know, something like that. So you can use that kind of language. Like, you know, if you can't do something, it's okay. You don't have to do, you you know, if you're not comfortable, you can watch, you know, all these sorts of things. And I think that's critical. Sorry, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I just got excited because, you know, what you're naming right now is another thing I have on my list, right? Um, That, you know, trauma-informed gems, and again, we're not trying to make them into therapeutic environments, but just they know that this can happen to people. Um, They are going to make sure they are reinforcing choice. So, you know, there's a lot of invitation language, right? I'm inviting you to try this, right? But you honor yourself. You decide if you want hands on neck or hands on shoulder or whatever, right? Um, And that's one of the things that I, um, I do uh, to this day, I am helping um, gyms instructors learn more about being trauma informed and how to handle people who are triggered. And and if anybody wants me to come give a talk to their instructors, their gym, their people, their students, or whatever, I'm more than happy to do that. Look, and we're all in a we're all, including myself, always in sort of a phase of like growing and learning and knowing more. So nobody's perfect at any of this. Right. And the only thing I ask from gyms is just continue to grow. Yeah, man. Well, thanks so much for doing this show. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and the book? Um, well, the book is pretty much everywhere you'd normally see them on Amazon and all the rest of that. The outlets that you typically see books sold. And I'm on, on psychology today. That's awesome. Well, Anna, we'll have to do a part two sometime. I feel like we've got a lot more to talk about here. But um, thank you so much for doing the show and I uh, really appreciate you and all the thanks work you've done. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for being an amazing instructor. Hey, I try. Get, getting better every day, you know? All right. Have a good one. What is going on? Welcome back to Jiu-Jitsu Outlet. I'm here with the other author of the amazing book, Transforming Trauma with Jiu-Jitsu, Jamie Marich. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Doing well, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm glad to have you. A couple of the listeners wanted me to do this this episode, and I'm really excited because I really enjoyed talking to Anna and learning about her story, and I'm really excited to talk to you too and kind of dive into this a little bit more. And uh, kind of, I'd love to talk a little bit with you about like the science behind jujitsu because I think that's something that gets kind of like flustered a little bit. Like, there's a lot of people who kind of have the gym bro science of like, oh, yeah, it makes you feel better, you know, helps mm-hmm. out. But I'd love to get into some of the specifics. Uh, but before we do all that, I want to ask you the question that I ask everyone, which is how do you feel jujitsu and training in martial arts has helped your mental health? Wow. Well, how, how did it not? How has it not? Uh, so what a beautiful question. And as I believe I share in the book, looking back, the biggest impact especially when you have survived trauma around being trapped, especially being trapped by just maleness in general, whether it be physically or emotionally, there is something incredibly empowering about learning how to use even a simple bridge technique to get somebody big and scary off of you. And even though I train in and I teach and I study so many methods for healing and recovery from trauma, There was nothing quite like that that helped me realize I don't have to be trapped anymore. And it was all about leverage, as you well know, as jujitsu practitioners well know. So uh, especially from a trauma recovery perspective, that is a benefit that's that stays with me. That's huge. That's huge. And I love what you said about leverage. Can you go a little deeper on that? Like, how do you feel that idea of leverage kind of has uh, followed you to other places off the mat. Oh, Alavanka, such such a, a lasting principle that has stayed with me. I, as I think any practitioner would know, the whole leverage concept, right? It's about how you use your body, not necessarily the brute strength coming out of your body and how even just a simple, subtle movement placed the right way 
get you places than actually fighting with your body. And yes, obviously that's a lesson I really learned very directly in jujitsu. But then I started looking at where does this apply in other areas of my life? And especially in my writing practice and in my professional practice, it caused me to look at, are there areas where I'm trying too hard? And the effort that I'm expending in trying too hard, is that actually making me more stressed out? Is it making me less productive? And so the whole principle of leverage just really caused me to reevaluate other places in my life where is trying too hard keeping me stuck. That's powerful. It's like a mental thing. And you're right. I've, I've experienced that a lot too. I, one of the most important epiphanies that I have, have had over the last couple of years was realizing that a lot of the times when I would try too hard on something, I would mess it up and it would be almost like it wasn't meant to be. And I was pushing too hard to make it happen. But then I looked at my life and most of the most important things that I ever did or the things that really worked out, they all just came uh, relatively easily. And most of them came through me just tr being myself and like following my path, um, whether it's martial arts or maybe meeting my wife, for example. Like I think about that a lot, like the way I won't get into the story, but me, the way me and my wife met was very like crazy serendipitous. Right. And I think about that a lot, how like that's one of the most important, best things that ever happened to me. And it happened pretty much randomly. And really just the only thing that I can correlate it to was like, I was just being myself. You know, that's kind of what it went back to. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to meet someone. And that's just one example, but that's kind of like what, how that, what you kind of said made me think about is like, wow, like, yeah, you're right. Like the times in life where we push and push and push, a lot of times that's not meant to be. Like a relationship, for instance. Right. And Might another have to let it go. And know? another powerful lesson that I think translates is I'm, this is coming back to me as we're talking is about the impact of the breath. Because I came into practicing jujitsu having been a pretty serious yoga practitioner, and I thought I knew a lot about breathing. And then when I first started training. Uh, coach kept calling me out on holding my breath and not breathing through things. And I have shared that there was nothing quite like learning jujitsu and training in it that really demanded my, my, my breath to be present. And so a line that I use a lot in my teaching, I use it in yoga teaching. I use it in trauma therapy teaching is holding your breath does not make things easier. And I believe that from my core, I believe that with everything in life, that we can have this tendency to grip and tense and, uh, you know, grunt through something. Yet if we can actually remember our breath and stay breathing through something, it'll always make something easier. And I don't think anything quite like jujitsu taught me that. Yeah, it's the pressure test thing. You don't really know something until it's put under pressure, for sure. Well, Jamie, thanks so much for sharing a little bit about your story. And uh, I really am glad that you've been able to kind of take some of these lessons and put it into your life off the mats. Let's talk a little bit about the science behind jujitsu. Like what were some of the biggest takeaways you had from working on this book? I know it wasn't your first book. And obviously you do this kind of stuff for a living. Like you're a professional in the mental health field. Can you tell us a little bit about what were some of your big takeaways from writing this book with Anna? I guess, from more of a research perspective. I am still amazed uh, as I think about the book. Because, well, let, let's start with just kind of the first part of the question, the science of, of jiu-jitsu and really the science of martial arts. And I think any physical practice where there's an embodied element that... Uh, it's not enough when you've been through trauma or when you've been through a whole horrible experience to just think it through, that the body needs to be able to move that energy in some way. And I remember when I started training, just have, because I would train first thing in the morning and then I'd come into my work day and there was this sense of my body has never felt this alive. And there's a lot of neuroscience explanation behind that. Yet I think if if you've trained, you know that even if you're struggling with something, the body still feels it. And I think there's nothing quite like being able to learn to work with the body that really helps survivors in many ways. And then in, in writing the book with Anna, it, it was interesting because she approached this 
way more as the advanced, I would consider her the more advanced jujitsu practitioner physically. And so she really took into a lot of that, the, the history background with doing the writing and, and writing from a lot of the technical jujitsu perspective. But as we were writing together, I was just struck with what a dynamic practice to move stuck energy in the body. Cause that's very much a way that trauma has been defined by our larger field is that when we go through horrible experiences, we can literally get stuck in a form. And so I believe I even write in the uh, preface of the book that to transform literally means to change shape. And when we can learn to move our body into different shapes, this is why a lot of people find yoga to be beneficial. Uh, yet I think jujitsu helps us to do that with even a greater degree of intensity in many places where we can feel ourselves uh, so fully as we move into these different shapes. And it's, it's helpful for moving that stuck energy through. And I was just really powerfully reminded of that uh, visceral experience I had with that for the first time as I sat down to write the book with Anna. Man, that's so beautifully said. Um, and if you think about it, you always hear the word form associated with martial arts, right? Like karate forms or whatever. It's really interesting that trauma would play a part into that same kind of vernacular. So to right. speak. it's really interesting. Cause we talk all the time about transforming, transforming <laughs> in trauma circles and, and even when we settled on that title for the book, it's, yeah, I learned how to move my body into shapes that it never experienced before, or how to use the shapes of my body. I mentioned the, uh, a bridge earlier and just how, what, what a powerful symbol that shape still has for me. Uh, Cause yeah, it, it, it just helps us to, to move things through. I haven't read the book yet. I've been meaning to, but um, I heard about it from the listeners, like I said, and um, I just haven't gotten around to writing it. So I don't know if you cover this in the book. But one question I had for you was, what do you feel is the role of the vagus nerve system? Because that's something that we've touched on a little bit in the show. And uh, there's an episode, if anyone's interested, with a guy named Sterling Cooley, who's kind of like a vagus nerve expert, basically. And he... Um, he came on and he's a martial artist as well. And he basically shared that the vagus nerve, which is one of the most important parts of your nervous system, basically gets activated through martial arts. And, um, uh, but that's honestly really the only person who's been on the show who's talked about it. So I just wanted to ask, like, is that something that came up in your research? Oh, sure. Well, in, in our writing, cause yeah, the vagus nerve and vagal nerve and polyvagal concepts are very common and, and discussed now amongst trauma practitioners. So just for explanation, vagus is a Latin word. It comes from the same root where we get vagabond or traveler. So it means to travel. And so the vagus nerve is more accurately a nerve canal that really connects your brain stem at the base of the brain all the way down through the rest of your body. So you can think of it as the super highway that connects the brain with the body. And so when I mention things like just feeling my body come alive through jujitsu, that is because of vagal, vagal tone stimulation or vagus stimulation. And there's a lot of things that stimulate the vagus nerve. I mean, breath can stimulate the vagus nerve. Uh, working with yoga or swimming or any physical practice can stimulate the vagus nerve. Yet, in my experience clinically, there's something about physical activity paired with the body moving in what we call a bilateral way. So when you're moving one side of the body, then the other, which you're often doing in, in jujitsu is super powerful. And my most fa my favorite interview that Anna and I did for the research was with uh, Guillermo v uh, Valente, the son of Pedro Valente Sr., one of the Valente brothers. And in reflecting about his father, who was essentially like a second son in the Gracie family, uh, uh, Pedro Valente Sr., he talked about how he wanted all of his children to have training in martial arts, swimming, and horseback riding. Because those three things will teach you the key survival skills to get out of a dangerous situation. And I remember even when we talked to Guy, I had this sense of chills that swimming, horseback riding, and uh, martial arts, in, in this case, jiu-jitsu, all involve not just physical activity, but bilateral physical activity, 
alternating bilateral physical activity. And what we know as trauma folks is that that bilateral component of movement just really does a lot with moving how information is stored. And the vagus nerve is a big part of that. Wow, that's fascinating. That's super fascinating. Well, let me ask you this, because I've wondered this about the vagus nerve. I'm on the autism spectrum, and there's some research around, I guess, that the vagus nerve might also contribute to that. So it's something that I've studied, like I'm not I'm no like PhD in it, but I've studied it a decent amount. And one question that I've had from kind of studying it is like, does the vagus nerve just to get need to get stimulated and activated and then it's on? Or is it that there's like degrees of activation and stimulation? I guess is it is it something that can get powered up from one to a hundred, or is it more like a switch where it's like, okay, it's on, and that's kind of it. So that's kind of where I get confused with it. It's the nuance that's important because the vagus nerve can be powered up and powered down. So for instance, if we're in a state of immobility which is a vagal nerve response that is designed to keep us safe in certain situations of threat, we may need to learn how to power up from that in order to feel more alive in life, especially if we're stuck in that immobilized state with the vagus nerve. And other times we can be overactivated. So you can think of the vagus nerve. I mean, this might be an oversimplification, but it really is like the nervous system's thermostat. Like one way or another, all nervous system, central nervous system activity comes back to what's happening with the vagus nerve, which really is, as I said, a series of nerves. It's a nerve canal. It's better described that way. So you may find the work of polyvagal theory very interesting because polyvagal uh, theory really suggests that there's a lot of things going on in the vagus nerve. And it's learning how to work with the responses that we're getting to know when we may need to upregulate if we're feeling low how we may need to downregulate when we're feeling too activated. And of course, unhealed trauma or neurodivergence can leave us with a very sensitive <laughs> vagus nerve is, is how I've certainly experienced it. Uh, but it sounds like jujitsu has been a big factor in helping you to keep that balance. Yeah, and that's what I talk about a lot is how it helps me to avoid panic attacks almost just by getting the energy out. Because for me, my body kind of feels like a computer and once it gets overheated, kind of like you're saying, I just crash. And uh, and I need to be very careful about that. But jujitsu helps me to modulate it and I'll just make it so it's modulate not really a great issue. word. Yeah, modulate's a great word. Yeah. So, wow. Thanks for breaking that down. I've been really curious about that. Um, so we've got time for another question. I, um, I'd really love to ask you a little bit about some of the neurotransmitters involved. So could you talk a little bit about that? Like what sorts of neurotransmitter activity in the brain do we see stimulated when people are training in martial arts? That is admittedly a little out of my area of, of I mean, I could give you a general answer to the question, but somebody who's more of a specialist in neuroscience might be able to, to answer that a little better. Uh, I mean, I think of neurotransmitters in the realm of, what are the things that help the brain to process or to move information? And I would say to any practitioner of jujitsu that if you feel like something has moved or shifted after you have trained, whether it's something physically in your body, whether it is your mental state or your mood, uh, it's, it's a sign that, that information is moving. And that could be another, a way to look at, at neurotransmitters. Um, for more specifics on that, again, you'd probably have to consult somebody who's a little bit more of a neuroscience expert, but I will just say that whenever physical activity is stimulated in a pleasurable way, because I mean, a lot of us can go through physical activity and it can be painful and we can get into a big discussion of, you know, whether, whether pain creates helpful things too. I personally, um, have some feelings on that that might exceed the topic at this interview. But uh, yeah, that's, that, that's really it. That, that helping to stimulate production of neurotransmitters can certainly help information move. And that is one of the ways we define trauma processing is being able to move information that has been stuck in one state to hopefully a state that is more adaptive or productive.
That's really interesting because you keep what, what this keeps going back to is like movement, movement, yes. movement. And it's almost like this trauma gets stuck in someone's body and it can't move out and it can't be processed. And you're right. Like it just seems like that person is just living in that experience. So last question, let's say like there's someone maybe listening to this podcast who's dealt with trauma. What sort of advice might you give them for, for dealing with this and kind of being able to put it behind them and help this trauma kind of move through their body? Well, everyone's different that what helps me to process or move past a trauma might be different than what helps you. Uh, I do think mindset can be very important because on one hand, I want trauma survivors who are listening to know that what happened to you was not your fault. Yet what's often discussed is we can honor that and own that. And then what are we going to do now? What action are we going to take to move that through? Uh, I know the most impactful advice I was given at the beginning of my trauma and recovery journey was there was first an affirmation about everything I went through. It sucked. And what are you going to do now? What's going to be the action that you'll take now? So I'm very grateful that that mindset was given to me early on. And I think when we talk about martial arts, physical aside, it can be great mind training, mindset training. And so that would be something I think both from life and martial arts that I would give to survivors of trauma, that what is your mindset going to be now that you know, and now that you want to move forward. Um, and then find a practice, whether it's martial arts, jujitsu, yoga, swimming, some of the, or some of the ones we've mentioned on this, on this podcast, taking long walks in the, in the woods, uh, find a combination of physical practices that will help you feel better just about your day overall, your body, perhaps, perhaps yourself. Like at this point, I don't actively train jujitsu. I did for several years because of an injury but I still engage in embodied practices. Like I do a lot of swimming now that really help my body feel the sense of joy. So what is going to help your body feel joy would be the biggest advice I'd give folks. I feel like that's so important just for overall health. Like when you move, if you, even if you're feeling a little, a little under the weather mentally or physically, if you get out and start moving, a lot of times you just magically start to feel better and it's crazy. And I, I really love what you said about the bilateral movement. I hadn't really thought about that, but I guess that would make sense because it kind of activate both sides of the Yep, exactly. And and I, I very directly experienced it this week. I, I got sick last week. I had both an infection and a virus, and it was a horrible couple of days. And I knew my body needed the rest and I gave myself the rest. But after about three days in bed, it was, I have to move. My body's not happy right now from, from being still so long. So as, as I had the capacity, I get, I made, and I, even when I was sick in bed, I gave myself some gentle stretching movements because yeah. the body needs to be able to, to, to do that to the level that, that the body allows. That's powerful. Yeah. To the level the body allows. That's really, that's such an important concept too. Like, especially in yoga, not really pushing right. it and always, you know, for example, don't touch your toes, just reach towards your toes yeah. you know, as far as your body allows. I feel I like just, that's a big yeah. part. And I've just really been on this kick lately of what helps your body feel joy. I like that. Do that. I like that. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit, like, where can people go find the book if they want to buy it? Anywhere books are sold, you can find it. So if you're an Amazon, a Barnes & Noble person, if you buy through indie books, you can search uh, Transforming Trauma with Jiu-Jitsu, Jamie Marich, Anna Perkle. I know you'll have our, our names there. And another resource that your listeners may find interesting is I have a website called redefinetherapy.com. And on that site, a lot of breath exercises, yoga exercises, mindfulness skills that people can access totally free. Awesome. Well, hey, I'll put all the links to that down below. So if you're listening and want to check it out, go check it out in the, in the links. But thank you, Jamie, so much. And you have a wonderful week. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate you very much. Bye.